time ain't coming. You don't don't break. Don't you be the messenger. You tell her to tell me. Mm -hmm. I mean, call us. All right, all right, all right. This vacation be it's skipping. Well, it's, it's usually the vacation you got to be on like the Sunday, Monday, like that whole time frame. But I expect to be on. All right. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come in your presence. We thank you, O oh God, for everything that you are doing to elevate us to places that you have desired for us to be, places that we have not yet been, places that we have not yet explored. For you said in your word, eyes have not seen, ears haven't heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God, has prepared for us through Christ Jesus our Lord. But God, you also said in that very same scripture that you have revealed to unto us, however, those things and those promises. So Lord God, we thank you right now for revealing it unto us, revealing it through revelation, revealing it through the word of God, revealing it unto us, O oh Lord God, through prayer, through fasting, revealing it unto us through meditation and, and thought about your word in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, we repent. We turn away from every sin and every uh, every weight that would so easily beset us. For, Father, you said you have given us the grace to overcome that divine empowerment that helps us to overcome, that helps us to stand, that helps us to last in the name of Jesus. So, Father, we thank you now. We pray that your spirit would abide in this place, Lord God. We thank you now for the word of God. We thank you for the revelation of God. We thank you for the spirit which teaches us all things that leads us and guides us in all truth and righteousness. In the name of Jesus, let your spirit abide in this place, God. In the name of Jesus, let your holy angels, Lord God, come in and make this atmosphere conducive for preaching and for teaching. In the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for your miracle working power. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for sending prophetic winds in this place. Prophetic winds blow in this place. In the name of Jesus, Father, help us to tap into the realm of the spirit, to see beyond what we are seeing in the natural, to see in the realm of the spirit, Lord God. And Father, help us to you to have wisdom and kept and conquering those things that have come before us in the name of Jesus. We're so grateful for this opportunity to study your word, to spend time with you, to spend time with your presence, to hear your heart. We don't want opinions. We don't want ideals from the word or any worldly ideology, but we want to hear your heart. Give us your heart tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. Hey. All right. Uh, if you got lesson number four, principles of faith. Principles of faith. Principles of faith. We're going to spend a little time right here. Dealing with these principles of faith. Somebody say faith. Faith is the kingdom currency. Is the kingdom currency. I need y'all to understand that faith is the kingdom currency. Where there is faith, there is God. Where there is no faith, God cannot be there. God can only work where there is faith. Somebody say, God, God can, only work can only work where there is faith. Where there is faith. It's very important for us to embrace that thought because um, a lot of people think that God will work just because we want him to work. No, it's, it's our faith that gives him permission to work on our behalf. Y'all understand? Amen. And it don't necessarily have to be your faith as we're going to do, discover in the scripture. It could be the faith of others that are connected to you. Oh my God, I felt that right there. The faith of others 
connected to you can work on your behalf. That's why it's important that we have intercessors, okay? People who pray for others because sometimes we need people to pray for us. People who have a greater level of faith in the power of God to work on our behalf, amen? amen. So you guys, we gotta uh, get to the place where we not only just have enough faith for us, see, uh, I think a lot of times we as believers have become selfish okay we have become selfish when it comes to faith we have enough faith for what we're going through but we don't ask God to increase our faith not just for us but for others for nations how many of you have faith for the nations See, this is different. See, when God begins to give you faith for the nations, now God has to open up doors and windows and portals for you to walk into. Amen. Because you have faith for the nations. Amen. Amen. You you have a faith to see God to move on in the in the nations. So it, it's it's important that we begin to build our most holy faith. Amen. Amen. So we're going to be talking about these here principles of faith. Amen? Amen. Our text, our scripture text is Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1 through 6. Everybody, let's turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 11 verses 1 through 6. Now, I'm going to tell you how important faith is. Prophets can't be prophets without faith. Bible tells us that if God is to release anything in the earth, he, said he does it through who? The, Come prophets, on. the prophets first. And so the prophets got to have faith that they're hearing from the Lord. Amen. They got to have faith that, that they're hearing from God, that they're spending time with the Lord, that their ears are tuned into the mouth of God so that they can speak what God wants to release into the atmosphere. Amen? Amen. So when prophets speak, their faith must be at a level that is not seen amongst normal men. Right. Same thing with apostles. Same thing with pastors. Evangelists got to have faith that somebody going to hear this word and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Teachers are going to have to have faith that somebody is going to hear the word of the Lord and become more astute in the word. You know, I've heard somebody say that you can have the word, uh, that that uh, you can have the spirit of God and not have the word, but how many of you know that the spirit of God don't operate outside of God's word? He doesn't. The Bible tells us God looks upon his word to what? Perform it. Perform it. Come on now. God looks upon his word to perform it. Amen? Amen. And so we got to be careful. It's, cause again, there's these people out here thinking they're calling themselves great. Now, I understand what he was saying. He wants to have the spirit. He said he wanted to have the spirit of God. But you can't have the spirit of God and not have the word. Y'all with me? Because the spirit of God will teach you all things. Yes, but it's going to teach you from the word of God. In the beginning was the what? Word. Come on now. In the beginning was the what? Word. And the word was God. with God. And the word was God. God. So let's not play with it. Somebody say, don't play with me. Don't play with me. Come on now. So Hebrews huh? chapter 11 verses 1 through 6. Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1 through 6. Amen. Give so give y'all some time to get there for everybody trying to get there. Get there. Amen. Amen. Is everybody Hebrews there? 11, verse 1 from the Amplified it says, Now faith is the assurance, title, deed, confirmation uh -huh. of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact. What cannot be explained by the physical senses, for by this kind of faith, the men of God gain divine approval. Oh, this is, um, Hello? 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 By faith, um, give me a little volume on this one, please. 
by faith, that is, with an inherent trust and enduring confidence in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, we understand that the world's universe ages were framed and created, formed, put in order, and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God. Yes. So that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which it was testified of him that he was righteous, upright, and right standing with God. And God testified by accepting his gifts. Come on. Wait. Come on. Oh, come okay. on. Keep going. No, 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 no. no. Keep going. And though he died, yet through this act of faith, he still speaks. Uh, come on. By faith, verse 5, it's still echoing. Come on. Turn it down just a smidge if you don't mind. Right. I don't know if it needs to go down. I don't know what it needs. So that's perfect right there. But right. Whatever you did is good. By faith that pleased God, Enoch was caught up and taken to heaven so that he would not have a glimpse of death. Uh, uh, come on. Come and on. he was not found because God had taken him up. For taking him, for even before he was taken to heaven, he received the testimony still on record that he had walked with God and pleased him. But without faith, it is impossible to walk with God and please him. For whoever comes near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek him. By let's, faith. Let's stop right there. Verse 1 through 6. We're going to stop right there. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Somebody give God a hand. Praise for the her reading skills. Listen now. The greatest tool in your arsenal, your greatest weapon in your arsenal, when it comes to spiritual warfare, when it comes to deliverance, when it comes to healing, when it comes to miracle signs and wonders, speaking in tongues, whatever it is you think you're going to do in the spirit, faith it is your greatest weapon. It is your greatest tool. Your ability to believe and really faith is your ability to trust God without doubt. I, I view faith more as um, like good credit. You can have everything that your heart desires if you believe God for it and you position yourself to receive it. So, you know, if you envision it that way, I know I got a 412 credit score, but I see myself owning a house. So then you position yourself, because you're releasing your faith for the house, but you position yourself by clearing up what's on your credit. You then act on what you believe God. You act on what you believe because faith requires action. That's why the word of God says faith without works is dead. So you can pray for a husband all you want to, but if you don't get rid of your six boyfriends and your two girlfriends, like God, you could get a husband, but it won't be a husband. You could get a husband, but it won't be a husband from God. So when you're releasing your faith for whatever it is, if you understand faith is a limitless credit card for things that are spiritual or in alignment with God's will for my life, I can charge it by my faith. My faith gives me access to it, even though I don't have the money or the resources right, to pay right. for it right now. Because I have faith and I have a, a limitless amount of faith, I now have access to things that I could not access without it. Now, I need you guys to understand that uh, go ahead. there's favor tied to being faithful and there's favor tied to being faith-filled. I want y'all to get this. When you are faith-filled, it empowers you to become faithful and then you become favored. Because if you got one person you got a man, McCarr, you're young, single, and beautiful and there are men that are just really pursuing you. And then you got old ugly snack of two buck two Billy who 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 you're not attracted to him at all, but he is faithful. He is kind. He is everything that you ask God for. He treats you the way you want to be treated. He's faithful in the things of God. His credit is together. He's in a good place financially. He's ready for a family. And you got fine Felix over here 
look good like he like it. But he a liar, he a cheat, he cuss you out, talk to you bad, will slap you around every now and then. If you're forced to choose between the two, which one you gonna choose? You understand that? So Bucktooth Billy is ugly and he would not be chosen otherwise. But if he has the faith to have a beautiful wife and he positions himself and does the things that beautiful women desire, he's now in a position to receive the promise. Amen. Although he doesn't qualify for it. Yeah. He's not preferred for it, but he's been favored by God. So where she normally wouldn't even look in his direction. Now he's got favor. So favor gives you things you don't deserve or you would not otherwise be selected for. Y'all get that? Amen. I want you to make sure you get this while we're talking about faith. Because when you tie faith, being you got to be, you want to release your faith to be filled with faith. You want to release your faith to be faithful. And then you want to release your faith to be favored. Because when you become full of faith, you become faithful. And when you become faithful, you then get favor. Book two, Billy got a beautiful, fine wife because he was faith-filled, he was faithful, and he got favored. Listen, I want y'all to understand this so you get this. Faith is the master key that unlocks any door. Right. Faith is the master key that unlocks any door to the spirit realm. Right. Listen now, I don't care what religion you're in. So if you have the faith, it will unlock whatever it is that you want to counter in the spirit realm. That's why there's voodoo has the power it has. That's why uh, all, uh, yeah, La Ritterias and all of that stuff. All of those other, because they the people believe that those things will work. You understand? But we have to believe that the power of our God is greater. So with, with your faith, you have the ability to lock to unlock things in the spirit that no matter what other religions say they got, they can't even compare to it or contest it. You understand? Yeah. Listen, I want y'all to see this. Faith is defined. Look at number one. Faith is defined as belief and trust and loyalty to God. Firm belief in something for which there is no proof. That's so good. Complete trust. So we got let's dissect this definition. Okay. First thing it says that faith shows that we believe and trust in God. It shows that we not only do we believe him, but we trust him. Now, how many of you know that believe and trust is two different things? See, I can believe what you're saying to me, but can I trust what you're saying? I can believe that the sky is blue, but if I don't trust you that the sky is blue right now, then I, it's going to hinder my ability to move. I can believe that the water is wet, but if I don't trust your word, then what's going to happen is if I go grab a cup, the water may not quench my thirst because I don't think it's wet enough. Because I didn't trust your word. I'm not going to grab that cup and go get something to drink because I believed you. I took you for your word, but I didn't trust you enough. Faith is not just belief. We believe all types of stuff. I believe Michael Jackson was the greatest performer of all time. But If I don't trust that, then it's something else. The trust requires a little bit more effort. Trust requires confidence. Somebody say trust, trust. Requires, requires confidence. confidence. To trust someone, you have to be confident in their ability to do whatever. To 
trust someone, you have to be confident that they are not going to let you down. <clears throat> to trust someone means that you trust their judgment. You trust their, their, their mindset, their ability to make decisions. You trust that they're not going to harm you. You have confidence that they're not going to harm you. You have confidence that they're not going to let you down. You have confidence that if they can't do it, it's because there's something in the way and they're going to let you know what that something is. You have a level of confidence that it is what it is. It's going to happen. You understand? I can believe you for the moment, but trust is, is a long-term thing. So that's why it's, it's hard to get trust back when it's broken. Because trust is a long-term thing. When you break my trust, you've broken my confidence. You understand? Yeah. When, you, when you have broken my trust, you've broken my, my ability to count on you to come through. So trust is something totally different than belief. I can believe you do it all day, but if I don't trust that you, you will do it, we got a problem. Give you a perfect example. I believe Bryce can do 20 push-ups. I believe he can do 20 push-ups. But do I trust him to do it? If I trust him to do it, he'll get out there and do 20 push-ups and be no sweat, no, no off of his brow. But if I don't trust him, I'll be like, you know what, Bryce, I believe you can do 20 push-ups. I just, but you ain't got to do it. Or Bryce do 20 push-ups and the whole while watching, he ain't gonna make 15. He gonna stop at 15. You understand? I have I don't have the confidence he'll complete it. He can do it with some work. He might give some time, but will he do it one in one set? Will he complete it? Trust says I have that confidence in his ability. Now look at this. And the second thing it says, faith is defined as we are loyal to God. See, when somebody is faithful to someone, you're loyal to them. So when you come into this thing called uh, being a follower of Christ, a Christian, it th there's a lot of definitions that come with that word Christian. There's a lot of expectation that comes with that word Christian. That's why I tell people, you know, you, you got to live this life as a Christian in a glass fishbowl because there comes a level of expectation. One of those pieces of expectation is you're expected to be loyal to God. That's why sinners don't have a problem with seeing Christians smoking weed or sinners have a problem with seeing Christians in the club. And similar, similar, I thought you were saved. The fact that you're here with me shows that you are disloyal to, to the God you say you serve. How do we get that when they up in there? They expect you to be holier than they are. Well, you got, well, I can help you. I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I'm supposed to be here. It's, it's kind of like uh, uh, going to going to at and Stadium. We get our, we're allowed in the Hall of Fame, right? But there's certain areas of at and we're not supposed to be. The field. The field. We have access to everyone in the stadium except, except the field. So now, think about it. You go to the field, Somebody look at you down there in the field. They don't recognize you. So what's the first thing they're going to say to you? What you doing here? No, they're not going to let you in. No one. But if you manage to get in. You're going to be kicked out quickly. 
Why? Because you don't belong. So you got to understand that when we are seen in those places, it's the same mindset. It's the same expectation. Now, is it is it right? Am I saying it's right? No. So because they got to understand people are still walking out their deliverances. But let, let's keep it a let's keep it a hundred. Okay? Let's keep it a buck. The expectation that being a Christian comes with a cost. And people expect you to be loyal to God to the extreme. They expect it. A Muslim, they expect a Muslim to be a loyal to Allah. Why? Because I have faith. And my faithfulness is my loyalty. I, because I say I believe God and I trust him, then I, I just show loyalty to him and all of my ways and all of my actions. That's why I, I, I'm a firm believer that ministers of the gospel have to be very, very careful with their lifestyle, with their actions, because it sends a message. I know it's not easy to hear it, but it's true. Not everybody, Paul said it this way, all things are lawful, but all things are not what? Expedient. Meaning, I can do it. But should I? But should I? What is it going to say about my loyalty? Yes, ma'am. Where is that scripture? Uh, all, things, scripture? Uh, all things are lawful. I believe it's 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, I want to say chapter 14. All things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. When he talks about drinking. It says 1 Corinthians 6 and 12. 6 and 12. But it says it's also found in 1 Corinthians 10 and 23. What it, re, re, look it up. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Mm -hmm. And all things are lawful unto me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And then 1 uh, Corinthians 10 and 23 says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Hold on. Because I want to let you know, because I believe he was talking about. 1 Corinthians 6 and 12 is the one that you need to read. First, yeah, that's the one I was going to read. 1 Corinthians 6 and 12. So it reads, All things are lawful unto me. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for belly, and belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. So, he's talking about uh, fornication, committing adultery, uh, things of that nature. Now, the body is not for the fornication. But the Lord, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God have both raised up the Lord, and will all raise us, will also raise us up by his own power. Know you not that your bodies are members of Christ. Shall I take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. Y'all see that there? So he, Paul is talking about sin. Yeah, you can do some of these things. There are certain things the Bible is not explicit about. But is it expedient? Is it worth it? Is it going to say something to about your loyalty to him? So you got to understand the third thing. Look at letter C. It tells us that faith is the indication that we firmly believe in something that the world believes that there is no proof for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not, not seen. Okay, that brings us, I don't want to jump too far, but I want y'all to understand it's the substance, it's the makeup of the stuff that we hope for if you're hoping for something that means you don't have it yet 
right? right? And so if you don't have it yet, you may not be able to see how you can physically obtain that thing. But you're hoping that you can get it. Look at your neighbor and say, get it. Get it. Yeah. It's the evidence of things not seen. So you may not see it, but because you have faith, the fa your faith is enough proof that it's there. That's why faith in God is so crucial. That's why your faith is so crucial. Because if you believe that God exists, that's all the proof that you need. How do you know that there is a God? I just know. And that's all the proof I need. That's it. Period. That's all I need. You ain't got to know. You got to figure that out for yourself. But I know. I look, look. If you know where I was a few years back, you know that I know. Amen. Well, what about all the death and all the stuff? It don't matter to me that's go, what's going on in the world. What about it? What about it? I just know for me, I should have been dead. Amen. Me and this woman right here should have been dead several times. Several times. Together and separate, apart. Before we before we even came together, we should have been dead several times. So you can say what you want to. How can you believe in a God with all this death and stuff going on in the world? I just do, because I know, I know me. Faith in God is a personal decision. It's a decision. And I don't try to force my convictions on anybody. But people ask, how can you believe in God? Because of the things that he has done no, for me he, personally. personally. My first account witnesses to what he's done in the lives of people connected to me. So I'm not going to try to force you to believe in my God. You know, on social media, they have this saying, if you know, you know. And if you don't, you don't. What I'm here to do is try to introduce you to it because I understand. Oh, nice. You may not understand, um, but we are going to go to heaven based on faith or go to hell based on the lack like thereof. Good. Come on now. All I'm doing now is being a messenger. If you don't want it, I understand I it. I respect your decision. Have a good day. I'm not going to argue with you about what I believe. I'm not but here for you. testimonies. He woke me up this Come morning. On. My lungs are functioning. I'm able to breathe. And even Come on, I didn't man. have legs, the same God created me. I have the ability, I my cognitive skills, and I know there are some people who don't. Man. I have the will, the, the willingness to acknowledge yes. and to honor him because I couldn't create myself. I can't teach myself. I can't create myself. I can't give life to myself. I can't replace no limbs on me. I can't, I can't do any of that. Come so on now. When, when you begin to explain why you believe, whatever that is, mine is my own personal testimony. I was shot. I lived. I was out there horning and tricking the spirit of God when it entered my body and convicted me. I got delivered and God has sustained me. So I have fallen. I have sinned since I've been a pastor. Since I've been saved. I've made many mistakes. God has forgiven me each time and restored me each time. That is why I love God. What he has done in my life developmentally. That's, that's why I trust him. him. He's why never I left me and he's never failed me. Come on now. now I, for me, I've tried to take my life several times. And he, is still the, and he didn't allow me to. He's always had somebody there to stop me. Always had somebody there to stop me from killing my destiny. Kill up. See, you don't understand what it means to try to kill your destiny at your own hand. But I'm so grateful to God he didn't let me kill my own destiny. Then there was times when we, this woman had been in an accident, flipped multiple times. Hospital thought we were dead. We were in the hospital. While they were preparing to receive two dead bodies. The nurses were looking at the news saying, well, y'all know they're going to be DOA, so we need to start prepping. They thought we were dead. And we were looking, and it was our car that was upside down on that bridge. And I was like, oh, they think we dead. They think and we, we dead. And we just started singing and worshiping and praising yeah. God. And so um, the other nurse, they started rushing and scurrying because they got the update that they were bringing us there. Yes. But their system didn't update them that we were already Ready in there. there. I had a scratch right here and a knot on my head. That was it. That's all when I say scratch, I literally mean a scratch. So you can't even look at my finger and tell. And 
Um, and so when the you know they were panicking and scurrying, and I was like, what Are y'all talking about the people in the that in, for that on day? That TV? She said, Yes, yeah. ma'am. I said, That's us. That lady said, No yeah, way. No. Yeah. There's no way. That's us. Yes, ma'am. We can tell you the license plate number is blah blah blah. She looked up there. She said, Yeah, that's them. The tune is over there singing. But the God that we serve, and we were able to minister and witness in that hospital to those nurses because they knew. When I tell you that car was smooshed like a tuna king, you couldn't even see how we got out of it. We walked out of it. We walked out. Really walked they didn't pull out. us out. We crawled out of the car. They're like, lay down, lay down. Be still, be still. We good. We're good. Then they pinned us down on the board and tied our necks down. And that boy was uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable. Because we're not used to being incapacitated. That's a word for anybody that's faith-filled and anybody that's faithful and anybody that's faith burned. You are not going to be used to being incapacitated. Being immobile and ineffective and unproductive is uncomfortable for you. Come on now. Listen, there was times I, I'm trying to go to school, working the 12-hour shift. I had to travel a whole hour to get to school. Waking up in the school part lot, even to this day, can tell you how I got there. Could tell you. Could tell you. Many times, it's the power of God. I, I, I trust Him. I believe Him. Yes, I made mistakes. Yes, I fell. But I still trust Him. I'm willing to bet my life on Him because He's He saved it so many times. You would be surprised. So what I do, um, um, what I do now, I don't argue with people about what no, I believe. I, I have, a, I, I, I'm gonna give you three Lord. earnest minutes. I used to argue because I know the word, and and they'll be like, "Well, where is that at in the Bible?" I, if I didn't know, I look it up on Google, a uh, uh, Bible Gateway. Don't come, don't be deep. If you don't know, don't pretend. Just pull it up and look it up, and give them the tools That's they it. need to to express why you believe it's not me. God has given us tools and resources to make us more effective in our assignment. So if you can be faith-filled and not know anything, but for you to be faithful, you're going to have to know a lot of things. And for you to be favored, you're going to have to be conditioned to move when God says move and capitalize on those pivotal opportunities. Because if you miss, you're going to have to go back to take another lap. You're going back to the line, end of the line, and you got to start all over again. And I just got tired of repeating the same dumb cycles in my life. I got tired of just... Like, why am I 30 when I was in my 30s? I said, why am I 30 and I haven't accomplished this, this, or this yet? Then when I got to 40, why am I 40? Why am I still here? Why, why am, am I 50? Struggling? So now here I am. I'll be 54 on my birthday. I'm not saying why anymore. I'm like, Lord, by my 54th birthday, this will be accomplished. This will be accomplished. I'm no longer, no longer looking at why. Because I've identified the wise. I was inconsistent. I was double-minded. I was unstable. I would make God promises and vows, and I wouldn't keep them. I would say that I'm going to taste my touch, not handle my unclean thing, 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 and I would continue to taste touch and handle the unclean thing. I was connected to people who were not promoting me and holding me accountable to do what God called me to do. You can't do that. Yeah, I was connected to people oh, that were holy. I was connected to people that weren't trying to live holy. I was connected to people that weren't even trying to live for God. Cause that, I'm gonna keep you, keep you. Nah, if he was real, real fine, and his voice was like thunder, and he was chocolate like the Hershey's deep, rich milk chocolate, and he had some big old muscles, and he was butt leg, and he had a little bread, and he knew how to talk to me and, and make stuff go to jumping. And he didn't have to know God at the time, you know. But I got tired of repeating the same dumb cycle. I would be with these men who treated me well, took me on lavish trips and had money and did all of that stuff, but they were void of God, Brittany. So when it came time and Spirit of God dealing with me and I want to pray, like, man, why are you doing all that? You know what I mean? Because I was trying to gravitate towards the light or be a light, but I was entertaining darkness. And because I was letting those men ejaculate inside me, I was allowing tainted sperm to come in and contaminate my light 
and turn it into darkness. So I'm trying to witness Bakari, but I wonder why people not receiving it because I got tainted sperm inside of me. And although you can't see when you're, what you're carrying is tainted, sinners can see very clearly what looks yeah. like them, what's familiar to them. That's it. If darkness is all you know, when you come to the person disguised as light, but if they're really full of darkness, you know it. Because you, you don't recognize the light, but you clearly recognize and identify darkness. So I was going through the church, and I thought I was a good, clean church girl, but I really was a demonically inspired or influenced hoe. And I didn't understand that this is what these men were seeing. So they would come, court me long enough, fill my head with, I want to marry you, knock the drawers down pay the money, keep me open because I was a freak in the bed, so they want to keep coming back for a good time, but we're not going to get to the marriage piece. It would be an excuse when it came time to marriage. So for six months, and I did that with two or three guys for six months, because I'd give anybody six months if I believe, you know, you're worth it. You know what I mean? I'm not going to just blow you off. I would, it'd be me and you for six months, but on day, six months and one day, it's over. If I'm not proposing, we ain't got to say that. Afterwards, I don't want to feel hard feelings. I did that with Mayfield. He dead now. But that's what I did. Carlos knows. Mm -hmm. And I told him. Sure did. I, I don't play games. Sure don't. I don't care how much I like you. I can love you. You can have the best everything I ever had. You're only going to get six months. If you don't know by then, good day. And I told him. On our second date, hey, he said, I really like you, and blah, 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 and where you been, and all of that. And I was like, good. So we almost two months in, and he's talking about, I I, I think I'm falling in love with you, and, and all of this other stuff. And I was like, well, that's good to hear, because I feel the same way about you. But let me just keep this real, real with you. I don't waste my time with men who don't know, who can't see my value. So... You know, we're a couple of months in, but when we get to six months, if there is no proposal, no said wedding day, we're not moving towards a set agreement to spend the rest of our life together. I'm letting you now, I'm going to abruptly sever this tie, regardless of how strong the connection or deep it is. And we were friends until he died. Very close. Yes. But I told him, and we're not going to talk about it anymore. You, you're not going to waste my time. You're going to have six months to have my undivided attention. There's not going to be any other men. I'm not going to do any of that. If you're serious and you're wanting to marry me, that's something you're trying to move towards. If you're not in that place, then I'm gonna be, not going to be exclusive. You can date who you want to date. I'm going to date whoever I want to date. And then you get ready. You want to be serious. We, you know, we can do it that way. Oh, well, no, I want us to be exclusive. Okay, no problem. I'm cool, too, because I'm feeling you, too. But guess what? When six months roll around, if I don't have a ring with a set date, with invitations gone out, Sayonara. it's going to be a good day. So we were four months into it. By now, he coming over. He hanging out. He spending nights. He he got a key. I got keys. It then got real, right? So I had the conversation with him. I said, hey, you know, uh, my birthday rolled around, and uh, he played this big special night, limousine, roses, had the people serenade me, all of that. That was beautiful. I thought he was going to propose. No proposal. So then we went. We had a nice little beautiful romantic night. And, you know, he was like, woke up the next morning, he said, what's wrong? And I was like, I don't know. I just kind of really thought that when you went all out and did that, there was going to be a proposal following. And he was like, oh, it's going to happen in due time. And I said, I just want to make sure you know. I think it was like July the 11th or July the 12th, something like that. I said, I just want to make sure you are aware that if we do not have an engagement a ring on my finger, a set date where we sent invitations out and people are invited to the wedding on July 11th. On July 12th, I'm going to change my locks. I'm changing my phone number and you will never be able to speak to me in a romantic capacity again. We're not coming back. I'm not going to pray about it. I'm not going to talk about it. It's going to be the end of our relationship as you know it and hopefully we can still be friends afterwards. And That's kind of cold. As you can see, July 11th came and went. We went out on July 11th. We had a great time. So, of course, I mean, July 10th. We had a great time. A great time. And so I was saying to myself, if July 10th rolled around, I mean, if he proposed tonight, I can just create invitations tomorrow. Great time. The invitations have to be out by July 11th at midnight. Really? If they're not, it's a good day. We went out. Great we had time. a great time. 
We really did spend more time together. Spend time. It was romantic. It was amazing. He cooked oh. for me and everything. Yeah. Oh. Woke up the next day, July 11th. Love, he wrote me beautiful love letters, sent roses. Yeah, everything was beautiful. But no proposal. So, and I lived in an apartment at the time. So July 12th, I woke up. I went to the landlord, to the office. I called my boss. I said, I'm going to be a couple hours late. I have to take care of some stuff. I went to the landlord. I said, hey, I need to change my locks. Clink, clink. Got my locks changed on my door. Then I worked for the cell phone company. I went right on in there. They changed my phone number. No problem. I called my pastor because he was coming to the church. Everybody knew us as a couple. They liked him. I said, hey, I want you to know we broke up today. He said, what happened? I said, he didn't propose. And he said, yeah, but but what happened? Did y'all have a fight? I said, no. I have a set time. I don't give a man more than six months. Oh, my daughter, maybe you want to reconsider. He's a great man of God. I said, I understand he is a great man of God, and there are single women in the church that you can hook him up with. I'm just letting you know that we've broken up. So moving forward, when you see him, do not treat him as a couple to me, and do not expect me to be a couple to him. I have another date scheduled with somebody tonight, and hopefully if things go well, you'll meet him on Sunday. He said, there's no way you can move on that quickly. Sir, it's done. It's I'm done. not asking questions. I'm letting you know what's about to happen next. It's done. Because I don't let no man waste my time. He came to me. He had, he knew. Because I was dating like seven or eight dudes. Yeah. I'm telling y'all about, the, we're still talking about faith. I know my value, Brittany. I know my worth. The car. I don't care what how do you feel about it. If you like it, then you gotta put a ring on it or get the hell on. I'm fat and old. God forbid if something happened to him right now, I'm not gonna be single six months. I probably won't be single six days. I might be, but I won't. It's gonna be some man trying to marry me immediately. He's had me in to tell him why we married. Don't you ever let her go? Well, she ain't gonna hit the market. I need y'all to put y'all, I need y'all to understand when you release your faith. I said I'll never be by myself. I'll never be one of those women that's trying to figure it out. I will always be desired. These are things I decree over myself. Quality men will gravitate towards me. I won't have to work hard in relationship. All of these things are things that I decree by faith. The husband I have is going to be faithful. He's going to be good in bed. He's going to be hardworking. He's going to make six figures. I should have asked for seven. I'm thankful for the six, but I should have said he's going to make seven figures because all the other stuff manifests in my faith. With her help, of course. I positioned myself to receive the blessing, but I always had the faith. Your faith shapes, it frames your life. You can tell how much faith a person really has by what their life looks like. Because sometimes we think we're full of faith and we're really not. We have very little faith. Because when you're full of faith, there's a manifestation of multiple blessings in your life. You jump in the head, girl. Quit jumping. Look at, uh, look at Roman number two. Faith is the foundation. Somebody, faith is the foundation. Faith is the foundation. Faith is the foundation upon which every word of God is established. Listen now. If God's word is going to be established in your life, it's only going to be established based on your level of faith. Amen. Did y'all hear what I just said? Yeah. If you want the word of God to be established in your life on a greater measure, you need to have a whole lot of faith in it. You understand? Yeah. Now, Paul tells us that faith is the substance, the essential nature, essence. Let's let's let it's the essential nature. Substance is the essential nature. It's the essence. It's what makes up. Okay, the ultimate reality that underlines all outward manifestations and change. Physical material from which something is made or which has discrete existence. Wow. Listen now. If it's the substance of a thing, that means. It is what makes it up. It's down to the very molecule level. It's down to the atom level. We're talking about protons and neutrons and electrons. Your faith is even down to that level. 
That's why the Bible says, if you have the faith of the size of a grain of a mustard seed, listen now, if, if that much faith has enough power to cause thing, cause a mountain to be moved, listen now, it, it doesn't take a lot to do anything in Christ Jesus. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Bakari, it don't take a lot of faith. Because it is the very thing that makes up what you believe in God for. Not only that, but it's also the evidence. What is the what is evidence? It looks at look, look at number two. It says it's an outward sign, an indication, something that furnishes proof, testimony. Somebody say testimony. Testimony. What is your testimony? Your testimony is your faith. One who bears witness. Your faith is the witness of God's ability to move and to operate in the earth realm. Now, I don't know why these things, well, I do know why those things happen, but I bear witness of a God who can turn things around. I bear witness of a God who can save your life. I bear witness of a God who can allow you to walk out of an accident untouched, unscathed. I am a witness. I bear witness of a God who heals. I bear witness of a God who hears my voice and moves upon my words. I bear witness of a God who, who hears my voice to stop the weather from happening. Stop rains and hurricanes from coming. I bear witness of those things. I bear witness of a, of, of a God who, who speaks through his prophets with accuracy, with clarity, with preciseness. I don't have to see it. When the Lord spoke to me in 2018, of uh, 2019, of COVID, I didn't know it was COVID. All I know, the Lord spoke it, that we need to prepare. We need at least six months of savings. Because whatever was coming down the pipeline was going to shut everything down for six months. I, I, I'm not a prophet. Let them tell you, I don't prophesy a lot. But when I do prophesy, you better take it to the bank. You better take it to the bank. And people were struggling. People were struggling. Was, was trying to survive. Not us. People were losing their jobs. Not us. People were, thrive, were thriving. Not us. Heck, we moved our church in the middle of COVID. From Tampa, Florida to Dallas, Texas. And it was the right opportunity because that's how we got in with all the savings. That's how most of the people that have savings have one or two or three contracts or four or five, but we have 10 because nobody, they couldn't get people. So we work were going in through every door yep. to work the stadiums. And now because we were there when they had nobody, we are now working Hall of Fames and premium locations. We just got the, the two stand or thing over in the Hall of Fame at Toyota Stadium. All because we prepared ourselves. We okay. moved, we aligned ourselves, yeah, positioned ourselves to receive the promise, and we moved by faith, and God favored us. So I'm a witness. I don't need to see proof. I don't need to see God in the flesh. I would like to see him in the flesh, but I don't need to, because I've seen his hand move in my life. Right. Well, you ain't walked on water like Jesus. I don't need to. I don't I seen God move upon my word. I seen God. I seen God move upon my word when I prayed a prayer to stop the rain. The two things, two miracles that I saw. Um, when he, when it was flooding and storming, like flooding, to the point where the it was a whole congregation of people coming to our service, and there was a bridge, the Howard Franklin Bridge. So they were getting ready to shut. They were on the news saying they may have to shut the bridge down because the storm was so bad. Carlos walked outside in the middle of the rain, 
spoke, probably prayed to God and spoke to the winds and the rain. And he said, I command you to cease now. Amen. Winds, I command, start, I command you to stop blowing now. And immediately that rain stopped and those winds stopped and they were able to come to that church. I saw that with my own two eyes. The other thing I saw God use him to do, it was a lady that was 67 years old. She had been mute for, couldn't hear, for 67 years. And God used him to lay hands on her. He had, the church was about four times bigger than this. He had them to take her to the back. And he said, can all of the people that can hear, can y'all still hear me? And he said, um, and, and so they had somebody in the hallway saying, can y'all hear what I'm saying? And they were like, no, what is he saying? So he said, open the door to the room where she was. He opened that door and Carlos began to speak over the microphone. And he began to say, he said, tell her to repeat what I'm saying. And he said, thank you, God, for restoring my hearing. And she said, thank you, God, for restoring my hearing. Because she couldn't frame the words, but you could tell she was hearing what he was saying. He said, say, I love you, Jesus. Say, I love you, Jesus. A 67-year-old woman who never spoke, sounded like a child, but she was able to hear him and emulate those sounds. That ain't him. I sleep with this man every night. That was God. I just got faith. But he had that faith. I got faith. It's God. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer, did you, I forgot that. I was crying, crying, crying. What you crying for? He laid hands. He anointed my breast. He said, I command cancer to go. And he said, when you go back, I had an appointment the next day. He said, when you go tomorrow, they do another biopsy. They're not going to find any evidence. That man said, what happened? What did you do? What did you take? I said, my husband just prayed. He said, there's no way. He was an atheist. So he made me go again, didn't he? He sent me to two places. Two places. Had to do a whole nother biopsy. Because he couldn't believe it. Find it. They made they did it on both breasts because they thought maybe, oh, maybe we checked the wrong breast. Couldn't find it. Had no cancer. I ain't special. I just believe God. Right. I'm not special. I'm not special. I just believe God. Period. I trust him. I look at this book right here, and the book says I can do it. So why am I doing it? Why? The book says you can do it. So why aren't you doing it? My faith is like, oh, excuse me, I don't even jump in the lines for healing and stuff. When people need healing, I let the people that are anointed for it pray. You know what I release my faith for? Marriages. We did that boot camp the first night. And that was two months ago, a month and a half ago. That lady came back the second night and she said, I did what you told me to do and he proposed to me last night. She came back the next day. She been living with that man for six years. I need you to understand if you apply that same level of faith to, to healing, you will heal. If you apply that same level of faith to miracle signs and wonders, it shall happen. If you just apply, it's, not, it's no different faith. It's the same faith. Y'all hear what I'm saying? It's the same thing. If you have enough, see, I'm going to prove it to you. Y'all got faith to believe God? Y'all sitting in the chairs, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. You have enough faith to believe that God is going to allow those chairs to hold your weight up. You had enough faith to get in your car and come to church tonight and arrive safely. You got it. It's the same faith. It's the same level of faith. You just got to believe that you can apply it to everything else. Look at your situation and speak to it in the name of Jesus. So I know the Bible says the poor you shall have with you always. I know Jesus said that, but he didn't say that they would be the poor. He didn't say that we would be the poor. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Yes. He didn't say that it, that was us. And it don't have to be us. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Right. Come in. Come on in. 
coming for orientation? Yes, ma'am. Have a seat. Mm-hmm. We're finishing up our Bible study and we'll start at the cross. So I, I come on here, have a seat. So I need y'all to understand that this faith that I have in God is not is it's not because I'm special. It's because that I know what he has done. I've seen it with my own eyes. And listen now, here's the cool part. That when something new comes my way, man, please. I know he's going to move that as well. Why? Because he's done other stuff that was new that came my way. He's dealt with other things that was new that came my way. So I don't have to worry or or fret about anything new that comes this way. See, what, what other people look like look at as a curse, we see it as a blessing. And the reason is because we've been on the opposite side of the coin. He grew up a church boy. I grew up a hood chick. So when I was incarcerated, of course, when you get that mark and you're young, it hinders opportunities for you as you grow older. But if I hadn't have got locked up as a teenager, then I would have things in this church that will accommodate people who've been incarcerated. God cleared my name. Now I can get through any background check, everything expunged. So guess what? I'm coming through the door and I'm bringing people with my same stripes and struggles with me because they want you to either be broke, right? Because you can't get a good paying job. You got the type of charges I had. So now you got to be broke, right? Or you got to go back to hustling. And I didn't want to go back to hoeing and tricking and stripping. And I didn't want, you know, okay, I'm saved now. God got me. So if God got me, God, I need you to show me a more excellent way to do what you call me to do to help your people. So I can't do this little yeah. bougie. I have college education, yeah. but I can't do this little bougie part because the people I'm called to are the ones that society don't want to be bothered with. So we got to provide jobs. They don't pay a million dollars. But I know when I first came out, I didn't have no opportunities. They didn't want to be bothered with me because they viewed me as a violent criminal. I was reformed. It's called the Department of Corrections, DOC. I was corrected. I've never been incarcerated again after that. But guess what? They don't care about what relationship you have with God or what commitments you're making to make your life change. You are a criminal who shot somebody, stabbed somebody, tried to kill somebody. We don't want you in our establishment. So for the church, y'all, what we got to do, we got to be the answer for everybody. Listen, I'm going to show y'all something. Because this woman is a sign of God's power. 100%, bro. She grew up in the streets. She was running around doing all kinds of stuff, hustling. Now my first pistol, I had shot a gun the first when I was eight, but my mama gave me a pistol for my 12th birthday because she was the camera shack lady. So, and I had to cut the dice game. If you don't know what that is, I'm not going to explain it. It's a good thing you don't know. But I had to handle money. It was a bunch of grown men wanting to try to fun with me, wanting to fill on me, wanting to take advantage of me, rob me because I was a child. So guess what? My mom gave me that heat. Okay, I got something for you. That's the wrong thing to do with a 12-year-old child, but it opened me up to these experiences with the people now that are struggling. They ain't got nobody to church of. They love you as long as you got something to come to give to them. They ain't right. getting no job to pay you. And to, 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 what? This is what can you do for me? So once I had that experience in the church, it opened the eyes of my understanding. God helped me to see the need. Where is the church that's going to actually do the work to help the people in my situation? And the reason they wouldn't know I'm out there because he called us to do it. Let me tell you this too. In order for her to be where she is right now, God had to put some things in place, orchestrate some things to take her out of this environment that she grew up in, out of her, from away from the people that she grew up around, right. and put her in a place where she could be poured into, where right. she should be taught a different mentored and right. mentored and, and instructed and empowered by people who who were in her shoes. She she worked with uh, Joel Johnson, who went to prison for a short stint, and and he came back and became a pastor. He got me in the prison ministry. Got him in the prison ministry. Then Willie Dixon. Willie Dixon was a man who came out of prison, saved, full of the Holy Ghost. Drug addict, dope fiend, became a millionaire. Became a millionaire. Hard. Legal. 
the 501c3, all the business stuff that I teach y'all, I learned that from right. those dudes. God, and, and God will set you up. God will but position you, but you gotta, gotta you gotta connect when you see the person has That's your it. answer and they're willing to help you. I did not like Willie Dixon. He was so mean and so rude to me, but he had my answers. This old man, he was the first one that I knew that had government contracts for millions of dollars. And I was like, how the government giving you millions of dollars and you was a dope fiend, a drug addict, he was moving weight, he had he he was moving weapons. How you do this? And he was like, I'm going to show you. But it's, you're going to have to humble yourself. Your attitude, your mouth, all this out of control. And I'm like, this old man don't like me. He said, I'm only putting up with you because I like you and I believe in you. He was like, I already got my millions. I don't need this stress with you. And if I'm too much and my attitude too much for you, go figure it out on your own. That made me humble myself. See, but I'm going to tell you something. One of the most valuable things I learned, I'm not going to have more faith in you than you have in yourself. Yeah, and he... Him. God ain't gonna put more. God ain't gonna put more effort into you that you don't have it in yourself. God wants you to succeed. It is His plan. It is desired that you live and have life more abundantly. That is His plan. That is His desire. That is His hope for you. He didn't. He did not want you to live the lives that you were living. So He positioned you. To be right where you are right now so you can get the faith so you can believe in you. I want y'all to, to we got maybe five minutes. Five minutes. And I'm going to wrap this up no, right now. No, no, no. I, want, I want y'all to understand when God puts y'all around people who know what you're trying to learn and they're willing to give you the information, go through whatever you got to go through to get it. I had a hot head. I was quick to cut and shoot and cuss people. I was horrible. But this man saw God's plan for my life. And he took time to mentor me and pour into me. Both of them did. Yes. yes. And, and, and look at this. As a result, it was most, I had many mentors. But, but, but God used them to change my mindset. The most powerful thing that man told me was, he said, you free. He asked me, he said, what's your number? And I was like, man, I'll never say that number again. I ain't in prison no more. He said, you might as well. You still got an inmate's mindset. You still won't be imprisoned in the, in the bondage of your mind. Because they don't call you by your name in prison. You're just a number. And I didn't realize that I had conformed to all of that. I didn't, you know, and when you're dealing with somebody that's been removed out of the environment, they see it on you. He was anointed to strip all of that residue off of me. So now I can sit and negotiate $100,000 contracts and do all of this stuff and provide work for people who otherwise ain't got a chance because I know what it's like. And he told me, he said, you know what your problem is? I said, well, he said, you don't know when to shut the hell up. I said, you're supposed to be a man of God. How dare you talk to me like that? He said, if I wasn't a man at all, it's the truth. You can focus on my delivery. You can focus on what I say. You talk too much. Your mouth is too slick and you're not going to go far in life until you learn how to humble yourself. All that was the truth. I didn't want to hear it. But after that, I started learning. And I started being healed. And I started growing and I started seeing myself no longer an inmate. But as a business owner, a wife, a mother, somebody that was a well-respected citizen in the community. So when y'all see me, they look like hoes, they look like bums, they look like thugs. Y'all see though, the type of people that connect to me, it's a reason. People know who you care and they know who you don't. They know what's real versus what's fake. The people in the street, what do we say? Just a few minutes earlier. Those that have been living in darkness, they know what's dark when they see. And they know what's really like. Feedback from tonight's Bible study lesson. I hate that half the church is on vacation. It looks so empty in here. Y'all give me y'all feedback right quick so we can get ready for our little um, our orientation for the stadium. Belief does not merit, merit trust. If you're going to heaven based on the faith you have or hell based on the lack thereof, the faith still are not used to being intoxicated. It doesn't take a lot of faith to get God to believe. The greatest weapon in your arsenal is the spirit. In the spirit is your faith. Uh, you must act on what you pray for. Faith is a limitless credit in, in the spiritual realm. Um, 
To obtain great amount of favor, you must have great amount of faith. Uh, there's a lot of things I don't want to put in there. <laughs> okay. Very, 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 very good. Um, I want you guys to know something. Where God is taking us and where he's elevating us to, we will have to move very, very differently. Very, very differently. And so everything about the way we look has got to shift because of the doors that we're about to walk into. And I'm, we're getting invitations into bigger and bigger rooms. So now I need y'all to be prepared to shift and move however I need y'all to move because I'm trying to open some doors with this feeding ministry. I'm trying to open some doors. I wasn't even looking for more stadiums, but now I've got the invitations and they're reaching out to me. So now what I'm trying to do is get us into more stadiums that don't do background checks because I need everybody to be able to eat and everybody to be able to work and do what they need to do to your businesses pop. But I need for y'all and the you know the other rest of the core people to make this a priority until we get the people in to fill these these uh, existing contracts so we can go and start with the new contracts because what what I'm looking for they got security guard positions they got janitorial positions they got housekeeping positions and so I'm trying to get that contract with American Airlines because then I would decide if we do background checks or not we gotta provide more opportunities, more higher paying opportunities for these people that's homeless so that they can afford rent until the church gets money for housing. And we gotta provide opportunities for the people with the backgrounds so they can at least pay their bills with what we're able to pay them until their businesses pop. Cause you know, most of them, they just need some money right now to pay this, but we gotta be able to teach them how to get the business off the ground and, and build. You gotta have some money coming in until your business pop to where you can move how you wanna move. Does that make sense? We got to get you off that job where you at. Her business is starting to flourish. Her business is starting to flourish. I need yours. You got it? All right, any questions? All right, we have her. Every Monday, yes. Only reason we're doing the orientations late after the